Good morning. This might be a man that's good morning, American Good Morning Church. How are you doing today? Ready to worship? Let's do some worship. Thank you. 
Thank you. 
This morning, we have a special prayer request for Karen. We tried not to give last names and details as much on because of the service being streamed over the internet. But you all know Karen, who usually sits down here in the center section. And... Uh, she was taken to the hospital this week with a brain bleed. And uh, as she's in the hospital right now, they have discovered that she has multiple tumors throughout her body. And we need to pray for her. We need to pray for her today and um, the family is... Um, any decisions had to be made on her behalf. So, adversity does not escape the Christian, but God is there. God is the great healer. God is all wise and all knowing. God has 
answers when we have questions. He has solutions when we have problems. And he knows the outcome from the beginning. And so we thank him for that. So we go to prayer this morning. Let's continue to pray for our other prayer request in our uh, prayer list. But keep caring, especially in your prayers right now as we, we go to prayer. Father, Father, thank you so much for your presence today. Thank you for being with us throughout this week. It's, we know that you are with us every moment of every day. There's never a time you leave us. You never forsake us. You are there. We thank you for every attribute. There are so numerous, we couldn't even mention them all right now. But Father, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your knowledge. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your holiness. For you alone are awesome. You are the almighty God of the universe, and we have the privilege of bowing before you this morning and bringing to you ourselves as living sacrifices that would be acceptable to you. We bring our praises to you as we've sung this morning, and we bring our requests to you as well. Lord, today we, we ask you to be with every need that's represented in this room and in the homes of those who are worshiping with us today by way of the live stream or worshiping by video at a later time. We, we pray that you would be so near to each and every one of us and that you would meet every need that we have. Father, we trust you. We come to you with great confidence because your word tells us that if we ask anything in your name, you hear us. And if you hear us, we, you grant us the requests. You grant us the petitions we ask of you. And you can do that. You do that and, and able to do that because when we pray and ask in your name, we ask for your will to be done according to your will. Because we don't know how to pray oftentimes. We don't know what your will is. We pray that, that your will would be done. And we have our will. We have our desires. We have our ideas of how those prayers should be answered. But you are the one who ultimately knows everything. And someday we'll look back as we gather around your throne and we'll see how it all fit together. How it all works. thank you for the good things we see happening. We thank you for how you work in people's lives. We thank you for Michelle and how you're working in her life. I ask you to continue to be with her, to strengthen her body, to strengthen her spirit. And lift up, we lift up to you today, Karen. Oh God. We don't know how to pray. But Lord, we pray that you would touch her where she's at. That you would touch her body according to your perfect will. We pray today for her family. We pray for those around her that are tasked with the uh, responsibility of of caring for her and making decisions. We pray for the doctors and the medical staff. We pray for her need. And we want your will to be accomplished. Thank you for being the other needs that we have that we bring to you from time to time. And there are, there are many can't mention them all, and we also know that you know them all, and so we don't have to mention them, we bring them to you as we can, and as we remember them, but Lord, you know every need, and you know every, every situation. Thank you for those.
those who are gathered here today. Thank you for those who are, are worshiping by technology. We just thank you that you are the one who brings your people together, the unity of the Holy Spirit. Today we want to pray for our nation. God, we live in a time that causes us concerns. We live in a time that we see things not as we would like them, not as we believe they were years ago, but yet we live in a time that we know that you are still on the throne. You are still the Lord of the universe. in a time where we are so tempted to insert our views and to become divisive and political and to make comments and alienate people. We, we, we live in a day and age which I know does not please you, especially when it affects the church. So God, I just pray that you would help us today and always to focus on you and to keep that perspective of who you are and that you have never ceased to be who you are. Scripture tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We believe that. We pray for our president today. We pray for his health. We pray, Lord, for wisdom pray, Father, that he would seek to do what you would believe is right. The Holy Spirit can touch us here in this house. The Holy Spirit can touch him in the White House. And we thank you for that. We pray for the members of Congress. We pray for our Supreme we pray for the government that we believe you established years and years ago. But you never intended that government to replace you. So as your word tells us to pray for those in authority over us, we do that. We do that and we pray in your will ultimately to be done on earth. pray for armed forces, wherever they are, that you touch them and protect them. We pray, Lord, for missionaries around the world and churches, pastors, leaders, and members who at the same time we're worshiping here, somewhere in the world are worshiping also. And throughout the day, we'll be worshiping at their times of worship, and we pray for them as they come to celebrate their life in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that all churches around the world, from the remotest village, to the largest cities, to our own community here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth, we glorify yourself. Father, we pray for those who are being persecuted today for their faith. We pray for the country of Ethiopia especially. We focus on them today. We pray, Father, that those Christians who are facing intense pressure to renounce their faith would be strong. You'd be strong and resist. We pray, Lord, that they have the strength to hold on to you. We pray, Father, for pastors and evangelists who face extreme persecution and for women and young people who want to follow you. We pray that you would draw people to yourself to raise up your church there in Ethiopia today. We ask especially for that country, as well as all those around the world who are who are being persecuted just because they love you like we do, just because they worship you like we do, just because they want to gather as we have. We pray for them today in Jesus' name.
now, Father, we would ask that you would be with us continue, as we continue to worship you here in this place. Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for saving us with that amazing grace. And we want to welcome all of you who are here today. It's good to see each and every one of you. I, I, I wish for two things. I wish that my eyesight was a lot better than what it is. And I wish right now that the sun would not be shining so bright coming in the windows because I can't make out who's here. <laughs> Getting old. I see shadows, but I'm, I see that you're here. So, hello, shadow. <laughs> If you're visiting with us today, we want to send a special welcome to you and trust that you will feel right at home, comfortable, and you'll connect with Jesus because that's why we're here. We don't, we want like you to connect with us, that, that's great, but most importantly, we want you to connect with the Lord and uh, that you'll come back and be with us again and again. If you are visiting, please stop back at the inter information center. We have a gift for you. Keep in mind that uh, Operation Christmas Child is beginning. Uh, this is the season. We're trying to get started a little bit earlier this year, thanks to Melinda Mentier. And she's scheduling a craft time together that you all can gather together on Tuesday morning here at the church. And you see that announcement in the bulletin. And um, get started. Uh, November, middle of November is uh, time to bring our boxes to the church. And so uh, just... Uh, Keep, keep, keep in mind our boxes have arrived, we got them here, and uh, God's good. God's good. So, we are going to resume our cookie fellowship next week on a weekly basis. <laughs> and uh, Jeff is going to be down there entertaining us like this. Um, but that will be where we, we, we believe we can start doing that, so um, keep that in mind. And I believe this is all that I'm going to make mention of this morning, so ushers, wait upon us, please, for our morning offering of tithes and gifts. <coughs> Thank you, Father, for your provision. Thank you for blessing us as you have. We give back to you now from what you've given to us. What we believe is yours. Gifts that come from a heart that's cheerful. Gifts that come from our appreciation to you. Bless each gift and giver alike, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. 
In your Bibles or your devices, you want to turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And we'll be looking at verses 8 to 11 in a moment. <clears throat> I, I never cease to be amazed in all the years that I've been doing this, how God... Um, lead uh, somehow get it into my skull, my thick skull or however to what to share on Sunday mornings uh, people often ask, well how do you know what to preach? how do you know where to go with that? some, some denominations use a le uh, lectionary and the stuff is just laid out for them and so forth and we don't do that and and uh, we wait upon the Lord, and, and, and it's not something that I think is super spiritual. I, I can't say that uh, in my day times of preparation that this bright cloud enters the room and a booming voice comes out and says, is this what you should do? And, but, I, but I do feel led, and every time I've done this, I mean, I, 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 I'm amazed. I, I'm just sharing with you from my heart. It just overwhelms me how I can look back and say, wow, God, you, 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 you led the right direction. And just so thankful that I can follow that. And I shared last week, I, I felt the Lord leading uh, in this direction to look at the seven churches of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3 of that book. And to look at that in light of what the Lord would have to say to the churches as he did in that day, and to the churches out in uh, all the world today, and what he would say to this church. And uh, today's message, I put a title on it, Prepare for What is Coming. Prepare for What is Coming. And that's not a popular topic. And I confess to you this morning that I struggled all week with 
what the Lord would have me share with you, this church, in these days, in this hour, and what he would have us to be mindful of as we move forward. The church at Smyrna was a church that suffered persecution. And I want to say to you, um, I hope that you are in agreement with me how thankful I am for the Lord leading Diane to be a part of our church. Diane Kalajanin has been uh, active in the ministry of the persecuted church for years. And that's how we connected and how she came to Genesis and now is an active member of our church. But she's kept before us the, uh, the, 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 the needs of the persecuted church and she's made an impact on my life. And I, I don't know if it were not for her that I would have the sensitivity that I feel I have today because of those around the world who are suffering for their faith. They're suffering for their faith because they are just doing what you and I are doing right now. We take it so much for granted. We sometimes don't want to come to church. You ever been there? <laughs> I don't want to go today. You heard the story of the man in bed saying, you know, I just don't want to go to church. The wife says, you have to go. But I don't go, want to go. Those people don't like me. It's just, I don't feel like going today. I don't want to go. My wife says, you got to go. You're the pastor. They're expecting you to be there. <laughs> We've all been there. We've all been there days when we just don't feel like going, and yet there are people who risk their actual lives. They risk their lives to go to church. If it's possible, even for them to go. They hide in basements. They, they go in groups of very small groups so they can't draw attention to themselves. I don't know what lies ahead for the church of Jesus Christ. I don't know what lies ahead. I hope that the church escapes severe persecution. I would hope that we escape any persecution, but I don't think that's possible. There are many theological positions about when Jesus is going to come back, and we all know those. I'm not going to reiterate those this morning, but many of us have been raised with the belief that the church will be raptured out of the world before the Great Tribulation. There are a lot of people who believe that the church will go through the Tribulation and Christ will return at the end of that time. And I don't know, and to be honest with you, you don't know either, because we don't know the future. If you tell me that you know for sure how it's going to be, then I'm going to tell you you don't know what you're talking about, because I don't know for sure what it's going to be. I can say today that I hope, I hope that the church escapes the Great Tribulation, but we don't know. There's a hymn of the church that, an older hymn, we, we, we've, we've been singing some of those older hymns. Um, I know some of you say, where did they dig those ones up at? But they're still there, they're still in the annals of hymnody. But this song, the chorus says this, many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. That's something you can bank on. That's something you can wrap your mind around, you can wrap your arms around, you can grab a hold of the horns of the altar and hold on to the fact that we know who holds tomorrow. And I know he holds my hand. Amen? Amen. I know I'm not a prophet and I am somewhat leery of those who proclaim to be 
and they can claim to know future events, especially as they relate to the Christian church. There are those out there who gain fame and attention by doing so, and then with our technology we have today, can turn just turn, turn a look on, on Facebook, or not Facebook, on YouTube, and you can uh, search for prophets uh, in the church, and you'll find all kind of people. I got one on uh, one of my friends on Facebook posted, so I watched part of it. I, I couldn't watch the whole thing, but you know. I don't want to throw cold water on that kind of thing. And yet, I will say this. If these people are proclaiming to be prophets and God has spoken to them, they better be spot on. And what I mean by that, they better not have any error in what they're saying. I don't want to stand in this pulpit and say to you, God said to me, or says to you, this and this and this, if it's not what God has said. Because that is the ultimate blasphemy. And in the Bible, when people prophet, pro 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 prophesy those kind of things that it didn't come true, what happened? They were put to death. And so we need to be careful about that. But Scripture does give us some indicators of what is to come. And we need to be prepared for the persecution against God's people. And so this is the message that was given to the church in Smyrna at the time that John received the revelation. Let's read that from chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know, how, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a, a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Father, I just pray especially today that your Holy Spirit would superintend what's being said from this platform, that you would Speak it into our lives and apply it as you desire. That you would guard this speaker from error this morning. I pray you bless the people who are hearing this. Father, as we face the future, we ask for your protection and your guidance in our lives. May we glean from this scripture this morning that which will help us as we move forward, as we prepare for what may be coming to the church. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Smyrna was one of only two churches of the seven that received no condemnation in these letters. As we mentioned last week, some received commendation and no commendation. Others received commendation and no condemnation. And others received both. Smyrna was one of those that received no condemnation. They were a church that faced tribulation that was significant enough to warrant such commendation. You see, in each of these letters, if you read them through, and it's not hard to do, they're not that long, the Lord says to each church, I, I know your works. I know your works. It's reassuring for us today as well to know that the Lord knows all about us and what we go through. You know, it, it, we are all going through things to various degrees. Every one of us in this room are going through something. We mentioned Karen this morning, and I can't even comprehend 
what lies ahead for her and her family. But what lies ahead for us before the Lord returns may be worse than physical things. May be worse than just what we may experience in our lives, daily walk, where something happens, took our, one of our cars into the garage this week, wanting to do some repairs that needed, and got a phone call back that the mechanic deemed my car, or it's really my wife's car, terminal. And uh, he said, come and get it. Drive it to fall apart. Don't fix it. Wow. That's what you like to hear, don't you? Those things happen. We all face those things. We all deal with things like that. But what lies ahead for us as a church, the church universal of Jesus Christ, and, and even us as a local church, Maybe even worse. And the hope of this message today is that no matter what it is, what the Lord said to the church at Smyrna was that true believers will be victorious. Amen. True believers will be victorious, and we need to prepare for what lies ahead. So let's look at this as we break it down. First of all, the Lord knows our affliction. Now, I'm going to say this, and you may not agree with it, and you may not like to hear it, but I believe it's true. Never in Scripture do we find that Christians are exempt from affliction. You cannot show me a verse that says because we're Christians, or because we're spiritual, or because we do this and that, that God will skip over us, or affliction rather, will skip over us. In fact, there are more references in Scripture that we find, especially in the letters of Paul and Peter and John in the New Testament, that refer to our response to affliction. Count it all joy when you fall into temptations and trials. <laughs> I don't want to count it joy. I want to grumble about it, don't you? Don't be surprised by the fiery trail, trial that comes upon you. Don't, don't let it surprise you. Well, usually it does. You go, wow. Where did that come from? Didn't see that coming. Don't be surprised by it. Smyrna was known for their affliction in the culture of their day. It was very difficult to be a Christian in Smyrna. Smyrna was a prosperous, a prosperous city. Many would say that they were blessed, and yet they were known for their persecution. We've become conditioned to a to a bless me Christianity. I, I think we need to confess that as sin. I think you and I, who are all guilty of that, have been raised in a country our whole entire lives, have been lived in a, a land where we've had the freedom to do anything but basically we want within the, within the law. And we have been blessed to have the freedom of religion, the freedom of worship, the freedom to go about and do and acquire as we please. But it's, but it's made us soft. We've kind of lulled into a state of saying it's the way it's supposed to be. In fact, some have distorted the scriptural theology by equating prosperity as an entitlement because we follow Christ. God, how can you let this happen to me? I'm serving you. I'm following you. Why, why are you letting this happen to me? Why are you 
why did you take away this? Or why did you do that? Because we feel we're entitled. It's brought a, a dangerous theology to the church. The American church, I would say, and the contemporary American church even more, that exempts us from adversity. And I would say it again, that we are not, not exempt from adversity. The church at Smyrna dealt with targeted poverty. You see, something we don't often see as we're reading scripture, but if we delve into it, we look a little closer, the early Christians suffered poverty. It was characteristic because of discrimination. Those who followed Christ were discriminated against. They were often deprived of property and livelihood. There are, Christian historians will tell us that in the early church, many times their homes would be pillaged. How would you like it if someone came to your house today and just walked in and said, step aside, Christian, and took everything out of your house they wanted or anything they wanted? We wouldn't like that very well, but it happened in the early church. It happens in persecuted countries. We're beginning to see the impact of not going along with the political line today, and oftentimes we see uh, the cancel culture. If you don't follow a certain line, that there are people who have actually lost their jobs, their livelihoods, because they took a stand or did not go along. And yet, the Lord says to the church of Smyrna, I know your poverty, and yet you are rich. Yet you are rich. And how can we say that? How can we say that a church is rich, or people or Christians are rich in the midst of their poverty, but they were rich in the grace and favor of God? Every one of us in this room, I don't care what your bank account shows. I don't, what, I don't care what your income line is. I don't care if you have to gain, get assistance, or if you are uh, well off to the point where you never have to worry about anything. We are rich because of God's grace. We are rich because of the favor of God on us as believers. Not because of what our bank account is. And it is essential to maintain perspective in the light of persecution. If or when we face persecution like other countries and other Christians have experienced before the Lord comes back, we need to maintain perspective. Not that the events of persecution are so bad. Because it will be, that would certainly be thought that way by us. But to remember that we are rich in the grace and favor of God. Smyrna dealt with the slander of the opposition. You see, historically, we look at this, and there were people in Smyrna who professed to be Jews, but were not. They professed to be Jews, but they were not. And they were loyal to Rome. They were loyal to the Roman Empire. The, 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 you, and you know that's what all surrounded Christ's life and death. People were expecting him to take over Rome. To take, free the people from that dominance of the secular government. These professing Jews were the most bitter of the opposition. They were the most bitter. In fact, not only were they bitter, but they were also the most difficult to face. We're beginning to see those today more and more 
that twist scripture and use it against those who take a biblical stand on issues of the day. People, people, I, I, I just, I, I just, it, it amazes me how people will get up and you see them on the TV and the news and they, they quote scripture to support a view that is so totally against God's word. And they'll just pull out of context, and they'll say it, and they'll, they'll call you a bigot or a liar or something worse because you believe what the Bible says. There are people today who profess to be Christians, but they're not. At least they're not living a Christian life. They are not living a Christian lifestyle. They are not living what the scriptures tell us to do. And so when they get up to run for office, they say, well, I, I'm a Christian. I, my faith is important to me. Is it? Is it? And how can you support something that's so strangely and strongly opposed to God's word? In the days of Smyrna, these False Jews supported emperor worship. And in fact, the Lord says that they were in the synagogue of Satan. You see, we could just maybe put that in colloquial terms and say they were of the, the church of Satan. Their church was uh, not necessarily a satanic church. It could be a Christian church that they infiltrated, but they were not in line with what the scripture said. In that day, emperor worship, very simply put, was this. If you did not say Caesar is Lord, if you did not say Caesar is Lord, you would be subject to persecution and even death. Does that put some light on the scriptures that tell us in Romans, that if you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Huh? If you confess Jesus is Lord, and so when confronted, people would say, Do you claim Caesar is Lord? And they would say, No. Jesus is Lord, and one of these people was the Bishop of Smyrna, Polycarp, you may have heard of him, who was burned at the stake for not professing Caesar as Lord. The Lord knows our affliction, whatever it is, whatever will we come, but the second point I want to bring out in this passage is the Lord encourages us in our affliction. He encourages us in our affliction. You see, the suffering of Smyrna, as we see in this short passage we read this morning, would test their faith. Would test their faith. There's two things we want to zero in on as we get close to the end of the message this morning. First of all, be faithful. And secondly, be fearless. Be faithful. Times of adversity prove how strong our faith is. How strong our faith is. You see, you know as well as I do, when you get that bad news, when you get that diagnosis, it rocks your world. You know as well as I do that it tests your faith. Am I going to believe? Am I going to fall apart? And when times of adversity, when they come, Prove how strong our faith is. It, it proves that our faith is genuine. And, and in spite of those things, we say, God, you are awesome. You are, you are the Lord of the universe. It proves our faith to be genuine. We can be faithful today because we know that God is in control. We can be faithful because it's not me in control. It's not the doctors in control. It's not the government in control. It's not 
the police in control. It's not anyone else in control, but the Lord is in control. Don't let your adversity turn you away from God, but let it draw you closer to Him. Closer to Him. I am just glad. I want to, I want to acknowledge to God these past several months has drawn me so close to him. I'm glad, not that it happened, but I'm glad that because it happened, my relationship with the Lord has become deeper. And only he can do that. I want that for all of us. Not to go through the trials, but because you will go through trials, I want you to experience the same thing. Don't turn away. Don't, don't let it take you away. But let, let it draw you closer. Closer to Him. The suffering of Smyrna would be limited, the Lord said. And again, the second point I shared with you, be faithful and then be fearless. Do not fear what's about to happen. Don't be in fear of tomorrow. Don't, don't go home today and say, oh no, what's going to happen? My goodness, if, if the Lord doesn't come back soon, where is this going to happen? I, I'm going to quit going to church. <laughs> no, don't do that. We need not fear what lies ahead. And, and, and the Lord says to the church there at Smyrna that the accuser, Satan, that's who he is, the accuser, will cause conflict that will result in punishment. He will falsely accuse us. And there are people that will serve time in prison because of that. And probably today there are people doing the same. But even death leads to the reward of the believer. So those words would be faithful unto death. Be faithful even unto death. Their adversity would have a definite beginning and an end. The Lord says to them that you'll be persecuted, you'll be tested for ten days. Now, if it was just ten days, maybe we'd come with it. If it was just ten literal days, we could have some persecution between now and next Wednesday when it's all over with and we've got to have a party and celebrate. That's not what it's talking about here. Ten days is often used in Scripture as a defining of something that has a definite beginning and has a definite end. Know that any persecution, know that any adversity that we have will come to an end someday. Know that everything in Paul has told us that it is a temporary thing. It is something that we go through in life, but it doesn't last forever. Sometimes it's even used in connection with a shortened time, a time that will be cut short, perhaps by the Lord returning or whatever. It's possible that that short time or definite time is what he's referring to the 10 days here. But at any rate, our adversity should draw us to greater faithfulness. Greater faithfulness. He gives two promises to the church as we close this morning. He says, if we are faithful even to death, we will receive the victor's crown. This is not a royal crown. It is a crown that is associated with the Olympics, like the gold medal or whatever. It's something that was given to the winner, the one who endured the race. And we who are victorious will not be hurt by the second death. We who, we, who, who are victorious will not be hurt by the second death. Unbelievers 
Those who don't know Christ will die in this life and begin and again in the ultimate judgment. But believers will die in this life but will receive eternal life. Someone has said it in kind of a pithy way, <laughs> said, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. If you're only born in the flesh, you die in the flesh, and your eternity is not eternal life. If you are born in the flesh and born again by the Spirit, we have eternal life. How about you? Are you prepared for what lies ahead? Are you prepared for what's coming? We can't prepare. We, 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 can, we can go vote to the polls. I hope you do. We can take our political stands. We can grumble about the government, but that's not the answer. That's not the, that's not the way to be prepared. Because whatever's coming, the only way we can be prepared is that we know the Lord and we are faithful and fearless. Be prepared for what's coming. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word, for the Holy Spirit and for his work this morning in our lives. Guide us in this time. Prepare us Help us to be drawn close to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. You believe it? Amen. It's true, isn't it? It's true, isn't it? I want to thank you again for all your prayers and the cards and just your expressions that you've expressed to us. It's so deeply appreciated. Um, this is my last week of radiation. And uh, I'm, uh, uh, they told me ahead of time that it's going to uh, affect you fatigue wise, and it certainly has. And uh, so what? But uh, that's what I'm facing right now. And uh, after this week, it's my first round of treatments, and a few weeks later, I'm going to begin the second round of treatments. So continue to continue to cover your prayers. But God's God's so good; He only really answers prayer. There are so many things I I, I I I I just wish I could just sit down and tell everything that God's done because you know you pray about this thing, you know, it's, it's personal stuff, you know, things that you know you know you know God help me do this one here, you know, and He does. And then go, okay, I'm going to go, God, I just prayer. And it's so cool. So, so believe it. God, I just pray. Thank you again. Thank you so much for praying. Thank you for your support. Thanks for loving us. And, quick, quick, quick. Um, I'm here. I'm here. And if you, uh, uh, don't, don't hesitate. Come up and say hi. I, I miss the being able to pop in right back there, but uh, just uh, as we ask you, just you know, don't don't breathe down my myself, you know. But uh, uh, I'll put my mask on and uh, be glad to just greet you up here if you want to. If you don't want to, have a great week. God bless you, and uh, serve Him this week. Amen. 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 You're dismissed.